So I'm Tulsi. I survived a plane crash when I was 10 years old. And to say my life has been colourful is an understatement. Yeah, and I just remember fighting and then literally the next voice I hear is my grandmother's voice. But I left my grandmother back in the UK. So I'm like, why is, why is her voice very clear? And she says to me, Tulsi, been involved in a plane crash and mum, dad and Gumlish haven't survived. You look different, but don't worry, we're going to take care of you. Because when everyone's telling me you look different, I thought maybe my hair colour's changed. So when I look at myself in the mirror, I literally thought somebody drew that face on. Either, I don't know, naively or optimistically, I thought in a year's time there's this magic cloth and it's all going to go. My bullying was very much the journey to and from school or journey to and from hospital. School was my safe space. The hospital was my safe space. So I guess institutions were yes. my safe space. When I go out into the community and I hear the word ugly, useless, you should have died. I start internalizing that. There's a car pulled up and there's four guys in the car. They actually round down the window and I was the only one at the bus stop. You're so effing ugly, you should have died. It's got to be 2009 and you think, for anyone who listens to my story, reads my story, like surely losing your family and going for a plane crash is challenging. I said, no, that felt like a breeze compared to trying to survive 2009. Because then it's going to be, sorry, it's just so hard. We'll see. Welcome to Millennial Mind. Hi, Shivani. So happy to have you here. Oh, thank you for having me. No, so happy to have you here. So happy we connected. And I'm really excited to share your story today because it's one that moved me a lot. And I think it's going to help so many people because you're so positive, you're so strong, and you have such a good outlook on life. And I think so many people are going to learn so much from you today. But for people who don't know who you are, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm Tulsi. Um, I survived a plane crash when I was 10 years old. And to say my life has been colorful is an understatement. Um, but I'm now a keynote speaker, uh, a humanitarian, and I do a lot of campaign work for change in the fashion and beauty industry. Yeah, I've seen so much of the stuff you do and I love it. But I wanna actually go back to that really difficult time in your life. So tell me what your earliest memory, memory is of your childhood. I've had a great childhood, you know. Um, I can't sit here and pretend it was all sad and gloomy because actually it was beautiful loving family, um, mm -hmm. you know, growing up in the South Asian community, it's all about community spirit, yeah. uh, togetherness, big family events, and that's how I remember it. Um, so I was quite a boisterous person. Yeah, I was that, I was the bully who tackled the bully in the playground. <laughs> so nice. often I spent a lot of time at the head teacher's office. So um, if ever you wanted to see me, that's where I was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so at that age, I was always fighting some sort of injustice, but I right. just didn't know at what scale I'll be doing it a lot later in life. Mm. So when you were younger, you obviously went to India for a family holiday. Now, talk to me about what happened. Yeah, so my dad decided um, he wants me and my brother to experience life, like real life. Mm -hmm. In London, had all the privileges, you know, nice clothes and nice everything. So he wanted us to experience life before we started high school, right. where I started high school. So we went to India, went to visit my great granddad in the uh, village in Gujarat. Okay. So on the west coast of India. And um, yes, yeah, so we lost our luggage at the time. Okay. So we went back to Mumbai. Mm -hmm. And my dad decided let's travel the south of India whilst we're here and then go back to the village later. Right. So in my head, well, in mine and my brother's head, we're going to Goa. Because mm. for us, when we saw the brochures, it's Goa, really, right? You don't right. see the, you know, the poverty and all of that in the brochures, yes. right? It's, it's all the glam side. Yeah. So we're excited, thinking we're going Goa, and then my dad, well, my mum and my dad both said we're going to Bangalore, and we both looked at each other like, who's that? <laughs> like, who? what is that? <laughs> that wasn't in the brochure. Right. <laughs> and um, so me and my brother reluctantly got on the plane, and I, I could remember us being really stroppy. Okay. So us being really difficult, like, why are we doing this? Mm. Why are we not going Goa? This is a holiday, it's not fair. And then we were told, like, we're gonna go to a few other cities, and then we'll end up in Goa. Okay. So we got on the plane, um, everything as normal, nothing unusual. And I was fighting with my brother because he was sitting by the window. Um, him being the youngest, he got his way. Of so course. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and I just remember fighting and then literally the next voice I hear is my grandmother's voice, but I left my grandmother back in the UK. So I'm like, why is, why is her voice very clear? Right. So it's not like back in the days when you're shouting down the phone, hello, hello, you know, it's not that kind of voice, it's very clear. And she says to me, Dulce, you, you're in hospital, you've been involved in a plane crash, and mum, dad, and Gumlesh are no more. And I'm like, 
okay, but I'm fighting with Gomesh right now, so that's my mm. brother. And she goes, you look different. So I'm like, how can I look different if I'm on the plane? Now that's the kind of only memory I have of that voice. Okay. Then I hear a young medic's voice telling me pretty much similar thing, like, um, don't worry, I'm taking care of you. All the medical staff are on the airfield attending to casualties. To me, he could have been the air steward. Like, it's a foreign voice. He could have been the air steward. So at this point, it's still not registered what's happened. My eyes are bandaged. I'm in an out of sedation. And I'm flown back to the UK. Uh, so between the accident happening, which is 14th of February, you know, it's not a date you can even forget, really. So 14th of Feb, I think I've landed back in the UK probably 17th or 18th. Okay. Those three days could just be 10 hours, you know. It, I didn't have no concept of time. I'm flown back to the UK, like, fire air ambulance with a family who were also in the accident. And the gentleman of that family is the one who pulled me out of the wreckage. So I was on top of his daughter. So obviously he was trying to pull his family out and other people. Mm -hmm. So he pulled me out, obviously pulled his daughter. So we all flew back to the UK. And then I was transported to um, St. Andrew's Burns and Plastics in Billerick in Essex. Now there I met with my other family members, so aunties, uncles, and cousins. And like my grandmother, they delivered it very similarly. Okay. Like Dorsey had been involved in a plane crash, and mum, dad, and Gumlish haven't survived. You look different, but don't worry, we're going to take care of you. Now when somebody says that, like at that point, it, I didn't realise what was actually happening, the, the gravity of it all. Um, in my head, I'm still fighting with my brother. So in my head, I thought my grand's come to surprise us in India and now mm. the rest of the family. So I'm still on the plane, still fighting with my brother, but now everyone's joined us. Yeah, and you're only 10. And I'm at 10 at the time. So that's what kept me going for a few days or maybe a couple of weeks. Um, in and out of surgery, you know, having a lot of skin grafts and uh, being treated for smoke inhalation and just things like that. Were you in pain or did you understand what was... I, I, I actually understand what you're saying because almost when you're in a state of shock, you tell yourself a narrative, don't you? And you try to make sense of something. And in that situation, what happened couldn't, couldn't in your mind, be true, right? Yeah. And um, so people telling you that, you, I understand your story of, you know, my grandma's here to surprise me. Yeah. You're only 10 years old, you yeah. know? But in that moment, were you feeling any pain? Did you know you were in hospital? Were your eyes open? No, so my eyes were closed at the time, um, had a lot of bandages around them. So where I was being treated for smoke inhalation and obviously skin grafts, because it had to because of infection, mm -hmm. I was literally in and out, in and out. So in that time, I've had extensive amount of surgery. I don't remember any pain. I always call it a mass pain. Okay. I mean, I know what iron burn pain feels like, and that hurts. So when I moan about an iron burn, like that hurts. So mm. when people look at it and go, but you've had burns all over, it's, it's a mass pain, so it's... It's a different kind of pain. Okay. Um, so yeah, then about sort of four to six weeks post accident and all, all the surgery going on, I had this opportunity to have um, the bandages removed from my eyes just to make sure they're all okay. Now in this time, the Dulce I described earlier, boisterous, you know, just loud, just being me, is still there. Yes. Because everyone around me is treating Dulce as Dulce. Of course. Not Dulce, the victim. Yeah. or anything, or any different. So I was just me. So I was excited to see myself in the mirror because when everyone's telling me you look different, I thought maybe my hair color's changed. Maybe someone's dyed my hair, I don't know. Got it. Um, so when they removed the bandages from my eyes, I was so excited to see myself. The nurses and the doctors all literally were like, I don't think she realizes the gravity of this. And the handheld mirror comes up and literally I'm like just snatching it to like, I wanna see myself. So when I look at myself in the mirror, I literally thought somebody drew that face on because mm. I'm a prankster right. and I thought somebody pranked me. That person doesn't look like me. Mm. And then I looked down at my left hand at the time and it was covered in like, you know, I had metal rods sticking out my fingers to straighten them. It was red raw with scars. So I thought, okay, something's happened, but either, I don't know, naively or optimistically, I thought in a year's time there's this magic cloth and it's all gonna go. So in my head, it's no big deal. So that kind of statement, it's no big deal, has kind of literally been my mantra throughout life. And so 
I looked at myself in the mirror again uh, and as the person in the mirror was moving the eyes and lips, I realized that is me. me yeah. um, I looked obviously very different. I had no hair, um, that just shave it all off. And I used to have long curly hair. So I looked very different. Um, obviously the scars on my face um, and you can see the hollow in the eyes and you know, mm -hmm. it's just, I just look like a different person. But I guess one thing when I look back at those pictures now, the inner spirit of who I am, you can see that in that picture. Yeah. So although maybe I was feeling different or something else, mm -hmm. but my spirit was definitely shining through. Yeah. And that has got me through so much, the inner spirit. And it's mm -hmm. really hard to not talk about, but it's, it's not tangible, right? Right. It's like but your soul. It's a soul. Yeah. And it was shining through. And that whole thing about not giving up, I suppose has always been there. Mm. Um, I find that um, unbelievable when I think about it for a 10 year old girl, because I think when you're younger, I think I let me think about when I was 10, I was going into secondary school. You're yeah. just about to go in. And I didn't have that level of emotional intelligence or strength to think if something happened to me, I remember actually falling over from a car and I remember it so distinctly. I fell over, I still have the scars on my elbow and actually I have a scar on my lip which loads of people, for my whole life, I thought was normal that you have a white thing at the end of your lip, but I've realized it's a scar. Um, and I remember falling over and I remember my cousins laughing at me and I remember it being really traumatic. And I remember feeling really, really upset mm. at that time. And I must've been like eight, nine years old. And I think for you to have gone through something so traumatic and to still say, I'm not gonna give up. And you know, I'm gonna be really strong and everything will be okay. And to have that optimism is truly unbelievable as a 10 year old. Because at this point, did you understand that you'd lost your parents? So I knew what had happened. Like, as okay. in, obviously, my family did tell me. Yeah. But our mind is so beautiful. That's one thing I'll describe our minds as. But I protected myself for a long time to convince myself my parents had lost their passport. So for wow. three years, I carried that just because that was my protection. Your coping mechanism. Coping mechanism and just to get through the daily chores of life. I say chores because it did feel like a chore sometimes because it was looking after my skin grafts, wearing the pressure garments, the relentless bullying, you know, all of that was part of it. Mm -hmm. So I call it a chore because it felt like a chore. Mm -hmm. um, but three years, I literally hold on to a fact they've lost their passport. And India being India, being difficult, would be a nightmare for to get them, get a passport for them to prove their identity. So I, I was even thinking on that level. And were you discussing that with your grandma? No, because um, culturally, um, I'm not sure how it would be for you, but for me, it was very much sweep it under the carpet, yeah. it's done now. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm not talking something unusual here when it comes to our yeah, communities, yeah. but sweep it under the carpet, it's done now, everyone loses a parent, everyone goes through this. Oh, wow. And that's as literally as graphic as it was. So oh, I wow. couldn't talk to anyone. Um, and obviously bearing in mind, everyone else is having their, they're mourning their own loss, a sister, sister-in-law, brother-in-law, right. a nephew, whatever it is. So, and obviously in, in Gujarati culture, it's we have so many rules and rituals and everything after someone passes away. Yeah. So we were caught up in all of that. You are. So, I mean, I'm lucky I was in hospital, but my family were dealing with that plus coming to see me every day, mm -hmm. trying to ensure I'm okay. They don't want to upset me so they wouldn't bring up certain things. Right. Um, and you were so young, so they probably, when you said, you know, sweep everything under the carpet, I do agree with you in the sense of when something happens, people are like, you have to move on now. Yeah. Don't talk about it too much. Yep. Don't allow yourself to be consumed. You have the 14 days of mourning within yep. our culture. And then after those 14 days, you move on. Yep. Right? Yep. But I think in your situation, when you said everybody loses a parent, that is a bit of a shock to me. And that's why I was responding like that because that is so hard as a 10 year old child. Yep. So if you were told that messaging and you weren't able to speak about it, you weren't able to process your emotions, was that really hard for you to talk about it to your friends or to Completely. anyone? Because I, having, you know, when my grandparents said that, like everyone loses a parent, it was like, how come my friends have still got their parents? Why? Like, are they gonna lose them soon? Do I prepare them? You know, I almost felt yes. responsible. Wow. So, but obviously they did have their parents and you know, 
you know, touch wood, they still do some of them. Um, but to carry that was huge because hence why I couldn't speak to no one. So this whole suffering in silence, it's across all spectrums. You know, I'm sure anyone listening to this can understand suffering in silence. Yeah. We've all been there, whatever it might be. Um, but that's what, that's how I suffered for so long. Mm -hmm. Because when I got bullied, so this is another thing. So when I got bullied, which was like name calling, people crossing the road and all of this, when I did share it with somebody like in a family or friends, but T, that happens because of the way you look. It's just accept it. So this yeah. again, isn't something uncommon when I say it amongst the visible difference community. It's almost like, oh, T, this is part and parcel of it. Right. But it's not, no. it's not acceptable it's as not. we know. So the point is, it's not acceptable and it shouldn't have been acceptable, but that's how they help, well, they thought they were helping me deal with it. Hence why I suffered in silence. Mm. So when I got bullied, it's like, don't talk about it. You know what response you're gonna get. So just shut up and put up. And that's what I did. And I think for so many women as well, it's like, don't say anything that's gonna get worse. Yeah. Or don't put yourself in danger, so don't st stick up for yourself. Yep. Right, and I think bullying in school is a really tricky one because for a lot of people who are bullied, they feel in that moment, am I gonna make it worse by saying something? Mm. Am I gonna tell the teacher and they're gonna believe in me, me even more? Or, and then you go home and you tell someone and they say, yeah, well, like you said, more is part and parcel of it. And so you think, well, I'm, I'm stuck, I'm helpless. Yep. And that's the worst place to be in. Yeah. So what did you do when you used to get bullied by people? Yeah, so my, my bullying was very much the journey to and from school or journey to and from hospital. Gosh. School was my safe space. Okay. The hospital was my safe space. So I guess institutions were yes. my safe space. Um, how I cope with it, like, I just, I internalized everything. I internalized all the negative narratives. Mm -hmm. So here I was, this confident tool, see, okay, fair enough, she has got burns in this accident and has a loss. I still had a little element of confidence because everyone around me was just treating me as Dorsey. Okay. But when I go out into the community and I hear the word ugly, useless, you should have died, I start internalizing oh that. So from having a, sorry, having a lot of confidence to now having complete self-loathing, it's gonna be really unbelievable for a lot of people to understand I started from minus minus confidence. So not even zero. Mm -hmm. Self-loathing at the most horrible level. If I, in fact, when I look at those pictures or I even think about my past, was that, did that really happen? Did I really hate myself that much? Yeah. But that's what happened. So I internalized all of that negative narrative. So where my inner spirit was still positive, surviving the next day, it's okay. The other aspect of was, is it ever gonna get better? I remember speaking to Annie and she was a burn survivor as mm. well. And she used to say the hardest part of meeting someone was meeting them for the first time. Because the first reaction would always be like, <gasps> or, oh, yeah. or something like that. And, she, and she'd always say that I'm fine. Yeah. Like, I don't need you to look at me in a different way. Yep. And, you know, when you meet somebody, and she was like, I understand it's difficult for some people, but that's my hor worst moment is meeting somebody for the first time. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I've never had that victim mentality. So for me, yes. um, I couldn't understand when someone goes, oh, poor you, or in our community, or whatever, yeah. you know, those words they would use. I s I'm far from that. I'm far from that. You know, now I say, I mean, I wear my scars with honor and pride. Um, I wouldn't change them for the world, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But that's a journey in itself. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, no, but you know, I've never had that victim mentality. I never was, why me, poor me. I didn't have that. Even when you were younger, Even you never thought young. that? I've never asked myself, why me? You know, I love that so much because when people say that, oh, why did this happen to me? And it's something really bad. I'm like, well, who did you want it to happen to? Yeah. When people say, and I, I mean that in the least no, harshest way possible, absolutely. because when people say, I didn't deserve this, and someone has passed away, I think, who does deserve that, Yeah. right? Or when people say like, you know, this is the last person to ever get, you know, cancer or whatever it is. And I think, well, well who does deserve something absolutely. like that? I guess when you're going through times like this, you want to self-loathe. 
it's very easy to mm -hmm. can't believe this has happened to me. This is the worst thing. I don't know how I'm ever gonna get over it. I don't wanna get over it. And it's all about your mind as well. Like how do you wanna get past this or do you not? And sometimes in the initial stages you don't want to and that's okay, mm -hmm. but it's all about your journey and moving forward. But what I find interesting is as a child to not say, you know, why has this, why have my parents been taken away from me? Why has this happened to me? And to have this outlook of it's okay, I find that really, honestly, really inspiring. So I, I, I think I was like, I surrounded myself with a lot of older people at the time as well. So my spiritual journey started quite young. Right. But I didn't access it until a lot later in that I somehow understood I had to go through this, but I didn't know at the time why I had to go through it. Wow. So again, that's why, why me never came up. Um, but the one thing I always used to do now, obviously I grew up in a Hindu kind of setting, Yeah. but I didn't practice it. Like there was no rules and rituals that I practiced or any, anything. And the one thing I used to do is always look up and go, just make tomorrow better. And that's all I'd ask for. I love but again, I didn't know what better looked like. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I always say is, whatever happens to me, I always say it's gonna be okay. Now at the time, I, I wish okay looked fluffy and glittery and glam, but that's not what okay looks like. Okay can just be, you managed to make a cup of tea mm -hmm. or you managed to get out of bed. Yeah. But if I did that, for me, I hit my goals. So my okay changed. Yeah. And that's what it was, just, I'm gonna be okay. Whatever it is, I'm gonna be okay. Mm. Um, 13, um, sort of talking to my auntie, who was a very pivotal part of my journey as well. And I said to her, do you think they're gonna come back? And she then said, no. So then I'm like, but then what? And that's when the penny dropped, they're not coming back and they have mm. passed. But because I didn't get to be part of any rituals, like the yeah. funeral, or any of my own kind of letting go, in my world, they're sort of still hanging around. Yeah. So maybe soul-wise, they probably were hanging I was around. Just say, yeah. Um, but physically, I felt they were. But now I realise they're not. Um. So sh the realization they're not coming back. It's like, okay, now what do I do? But because again, I'm around so much family. They're kind of not playing the role, but they were just ensuring my day-to-day -day needs were all met. Mm. All. Whatever I needed, all well, the needs were met, basically. Yeah. yeah. I think the only thing that was missing is all the emotional connection. You know, like the hugs, the reassurances. They didn't know how to give it. Really? Well, because they didn't know how okay, what okay was going to look like as well, because they're navigating something new Completely too. different, yeah. Um, the, the one thing about this is no one prepares you for life, right? That's the bottom line but no one should prepare you for life. Life is gonna happen to you. Like me going for a plane crash doesn't mean that's what you're gonna experience. So there's no point you preparing for a plane crash when that might not be in your path. Mm. So the whole thing about preparation for life, we can't. Mm. Whatever is given to us is given to us for particular reasons. We have to go through that, you know? Um, so yeah, like some auntie explaining that I lo my, me losing my family, all that love now, well, because there was no love in a, in a sense it was missing from myself because the self-loathing was so deep. That that love that I was looking for from my parents, I now start, had to give it to myself. Yeah. But how would you do that when you're a child? Yeah. So I'm looking in the most random places for it. So when I hit 16, 17, obviously I start looking for it in men, yeah. in relationships. Mm -hmm. The moment somebody paid attention, for me, it was love. So I'd go, I'd put my 110% and then when they dumped me or whatever, it's active rejection again. So it's rejection, not only my family rejected me, but now people around me are rejecting me. Yeah. But again, it's like, there must be a reason why they left me. Oh. But maybe it's because of my scars. Everything came back to is because of my scars. So that's how deep the loathing was. Everything was about my scars. Everything was about your appearance. Everything was about the appearance and, um, you know, some again, <laughs> being South Asian, our first point of beauty reference is Bollywood films. Mm. Um, you don't look like that actress. You don't do that. You don't like that. And that's People said that to you? Yeah, like that's what I grew up. And it's like, but even they don't look like that. Take the makeup off, they don't look like that. But I'm shocked. 
that yeah. people would say that to you. I've never heard someone say that. Yeah, no, it's Anyone. it was really deep embedded. So again, everything was media orientated. You don't look like that person. Because at the end of the day, there wasn't anyone that looked like me out there in the media anyway. Yeah. You know? Um, so again, what's wrong with me? Why has this happened to me in the sense of why is my scars like this? Mm. So again, that age, I thought God, I, I started hating God, so to speak, because it's like you took my beauty away. Yeah. At age 10, I didn't even know what beauty was. Because mm -hmm. here's me in the playground fighting yeah. the bullies. I didn't care about my appearance. Mm -hmm. To now going, somebody's taken my beauty away. But where I am now is I had to go from inside out. And it's that's why my connection to the divine is much stronger than I could, has ever been. Yeah. Um, I know why I had to do that. I know why the external beauty had to go in order for the internal beauty to glow from the outside, you know, Definitely. very different. But obviously that's the journey in itself. <laughs> um, and beauty is so subjective, isn't it? You it know? sure is. And when you're younger, I remember when I was 17, 18, I was obsessed with how I would look as well. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, oh my God, I'm so ugly because of this or this. And you, and you are so critical at that age in your mm -hmm. life. And I also think, you know, because of social media, as you get older, a lot of the time you see images online and you think, yeah, I could look like that. Yeah. Then you take the photo and you're like, oh my God, yeah. I look absolutely nothing <laughs> yeah. like that, right? Yeah. There's so many times I'm like, what a nice photo. I'm going to replicate it. And I'm like, what, how, how, why don't I look like that? And, and I've criticized myself so many times because of it. And then recently I've just said to myself, why am I trying to look like someone else? Like I'm never going to. Mm -hmm. My stomach is never going to look like a Victoria's Secret stomach, you know. And sometimes I'm like, oh gosh. And I realise actually, as you get older, is everyone has different shapes. Completely. And there's no amount of of like abs or something I can do that will make my body longer. My legs are really long and my body's really short. Yeah. And when I was younger, I always used to think it's because. I had a lot of fat around my stomach, but it's not. It's just the shape of my body and I can't change it. Yeah. But when you're 18, when you're, when you're 18, 19, even it, like in your teenagers, you are so critical because that's, I think, when everyone's trying to discover themselves. And when you're at school, that is the only thing you can talk about, right? Because yep. you're not going to talk about deep topics. And, you know, when we were at school, we didn't have social media. Yep. So the things you had were magazines yep. and TV. And those are the things you used to watch and do all the time. So it's very easy to compare yourself at that age, I think. Yeah, and obviously, like, no one in my family had burns or looked this way or people around me. So this is all new. Yes. So not only am I navigating that, they're also navigating this. They, like people around me, don't know how to help me apart from you look fine. Okay. Um, so yeah, being constantly compared, I n obviously I never measured up to anyone. And I'm sure somebody can identify with this, but we're all trying to be someone else, you know. If it's not our way we look, yeah. it might be a personality or the way we talk or whatever we're doing. But the whole point is we're not meant to. No. You know, and that's the secret of life is we're not meant to. <laughs> Sorry, so spoiler true. alert. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true because I saw a quote the other day and it said, no matter how many times something has been said, something said by a particular person in a particular way will resonate with you. Yeah. And that's why you have so many people talking about so many similar things, but so something said by one person is gonna resonate with you more than something said by another person. Yep. And at the end of the day, your superpower is you. Yep, absolutely. The way you can convey yourself, the way you talk, the way you express yourself, mm -hmm. the way your, your energy, that is you. Yep. And so many of us are trying to change who we are to fit in with the best narrative. Oh, well, this person got this many likes, so maybe I should try being like mm -hmm. this. Or this video went viral, so let me try being like that. And I released a video recently, well, I recorded a video recently about how we should stop posting for clout. Mm -hmm. Because so many of us are trying to fit the mold. When actually, the only way you're gonna make an impact is by being yourself. Completely, and that's exactly it. So for me, I was always trying to be someone else, mm. look like someone else. I'd cover my scars with heavy makeup, often looking more ridiculous, and constantly covering, 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 you know. Yeah. Um, so in that time, my weight's piling on now. So my way of dealing with life was overeating. Okay. So it's not a formal diagnosis, but obviously it's an eating disorder. Yeah. So I abused alcohol, abused drugs, never found any answers at the end of it, so I was like, this is pointless. Okay. But with eating, no one notices you're doing it. Yes. Um, and I'd, all the pocket money I'd have, I'd buy snacks and eat and eat and eat. 
and then obviously weight's piling on and I know the weight's piling on and everyone around me can see it. Now comes the word fat. So you're fat. So not only am I fat, I'm also ugly, I'm useless and all the other things in between. You've mentioned useless a few times. Why, why, why were you termed useless? It's almost like what's going to come of you. So, you know, I watched one of your recent videos about the whole wedding thing and yeah. the marriage thing. Mine was on the other scale was who's going to marry you? Age 10 in hospital. That was said to you? Age 10. Like, <gasps> do you even say that to a 10? I mean, are we even thinking about marriage for a 10-year-old right now? Okay, some cultures I get it's different. Oh my God. But that's why I grew up. So I never believed I was going to find somebody. I never believed I would get married or whatever. I mean, like marriage is a goal or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not. Um, but culturally, that's what they live up to. Yeah. So these are the kind of things I grew up with. So the word useless was very much the moment I was sitting down doing nothing, as in healing, you're useless. Who would be telling you you're useless? So this is all just family and just, it's not even my direct family, it's community based. I'm so shocked. And the reason I'm so shocked is hearing your story and you're a child to go through that is very difficult. Mm -hmm. To be saying anything like, what, who's going to marry you? Or I, I can't even say it because I think it's so disgusting. Yep. They must be really bad people. That's exactly right? it. This, this is what I grew up with. So that was my norm. Now, obviously, I step back and I look at my life from the outside and I just think, obviously, that is disgusting. That exactly. is gross. Um, How are you helping someone in that way? Yeah. Like, also, you're, like, tormenting a child almost. To be telling someone when they've just woken up, from something that's from a plane crash, and you've got scars all over you, for you to be told that day in hospital, who's gonna marry you? What on earth is that person thinking? And that's the thing, they never saw the child. And that's what I think is, the only thing that I can say is they didn't see the child. They just saw something. And I think that's what's sad. They didn't see a human behind, no. a human behind all this. So obviously I'm healing all of those scars um, so it's not just the physical scars, it's the invisible scars. Um, so I was healing of that, dealing with that, it's weights piling on, because obviously every comment that I get, yeah, and this is all about external validation at the end of the day, that's what it was all about. Any comment I got, I ate, you know, I ate my emotions. So weights piling on in the midst of, what, 1920, I'm at the peak of, peak of my depression as I call it um I'm a now size 24 wow. so in this time I've been to college I did um travel and tourism and then I went on to do another course in um hotel and uh, hotel in uh, health and social care mm -hmm. and a good friend of mine said Tulsi I'm worried about you um I'm worried about your health that transformed everything because you are fat you need to do something compared to I'm worried about you yes and, you know, back to what you were saying, it, it's the way you say it, how someone delivers something. Always about compassion. Absolutely. And she said that literally next day, it's like, well, not literally next day, but I do need to do something. Uh, I didn't know about depression at the time, as in what to do with it. Mm -hmm. But I know I had to come out of it. Mm -hmm. This is not me. Mm -hmm. As You know, a lot of people say, this is not me. You're yeah. far removed from yourself. Mm -hmm. But how do we get to ourself? It's obviously a lot of work. It's a lot of healing. It's a lot of deconditioning. Mm. So I joined the gym as anyone would when they're trying to lose weight, you know. So I joined the gym. Okay, weight was slowly falling off. But I encountered an experience at a bus stop. So I was going to sign on at the time. Mm. And waiting for the bus. There's a set of lights. Then there was a car pulled up. And there was four guys in the car. They actually wound down the window. And I was the only one at the bus stop. Wound down the window. You're so effing ugly, you should have died. Now, I looked around thinking, okay, they can't be talking to me. I looked around and realized there's no one at the bus stop, so clearly it was me. And this kind of reiterated the point of, is this how everyone sees me? Because that's kind of the kind of narrative I've grown up with. Is this how the world sees me. That's so the handful who are saying you're beautiful, you're nice and all of this, it's almost like they're irre irrelevant. So the negative comments were far greater than the positive. 
So I thought, if this is how the world sees me, then maybe that's where I am. Hence why it just got deeper and deeper. Now I'm at the bus stop. The lights have changed and they've moved on. They're laughing and they've drove off. The bus is coming. Mm-hmm. And it's like, just stand in front. And that was the only kind of option that I thought in, in my head. But then I was like, but I can't let the job center down because then it's gonna oh, be, sorry, it's just so <laughs> hard. I can't let the job center down because it's like, they're gonna be harassing my grandparents. That's who I was living with. But then obviously fundamentally, I'll be letting myself down. Um, so I got on the bus. I nearly did stand in front of that bus because it's like, if this is how the world sees me, then what's the point? Because even at this point, even though I was gonna be okay, I was almost like a really, so I was lying to myself almost. So I got on the bus, went to the job center, signed on, obviously feeling, anyone who signs on is just the most horrible feeling anyway, because it's already degrading. You can't get a job, what's wrong with you? And that's kind of what I carried as well. Mm-hmm. So I got on the, um, signed on, got home, and I was like, there's a reason why you didn't jump in front of that bus. You've, there's a reason why whatever it stopped you and pulled you back, because it wasn't a person, it was me. Mm-hmm. It's for something bigger than what you might know. Mm-hmm. So the whole thing about my spirituality and there's a far better, b- bigger reason why all this happened, it's almost it's coming back again. And in this time, I've met my incredible friend, Kenny, who's now passed into the other side. Um, but he is the one who always used to say to me, you're beautiful, and I couldn't see it. Mm-hmm. And he used to always say to me, I love you. And I'm like, you can't say I love you. It's just I can. I said, and I said, because I, I heard the word I love you as if only in a partnership. Yeah. So when he used to say that, I was like, how can you love me though? He mm-hmm. goes, but I love you. Mm. And I couldn't understand it. And I was like, yeah, but Kenny, you, you don't know anything about me. You don't know my story because mm. I don't need to. Yeah. And it's his words and his encouragement that started me, that started to help me get to the other side of not acceptance as such, because that took a long time. Yeah. But kind of there's a there's a bigger part of your story than just surviving a plane crash. It's yes. It's not the plane crash was just a, 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 an incident. Yeah. But everything after that is the reason why you survived. Yeah. Um. So he reignited my spirituality again. Wow. So now I'm I'm reading Deepak Chopra, Quantum Healing. I'm reading The Power of Now, and I lived very much like. Everything's about today. Okay. So I was already living like that, but when my family and everyone around me, they're living for the future, 10 year plan, 15 year plan, 20 year plans, and looking for this goal, and we've got to hit these million, and we've got to have 20 cars in the drive, and all of this. And I couldn't understand that, Mm. because it's like, how do you know you're going to wake up tomorrow? Right. I used to think like that from a young age, but when I started reading Power of Now, everything started to make more sense. Then I started to read um, the Bhagavad Gita, even more so. Yeah. I had it in my hands. Mm. I've read it. Anyone who's read it, it starts looking very complicated. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> Initially. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but it's so you know, simple. It's it's simple. Mm. The message is very simple. I started to read Mahabharat. Um, that for me has been very poignant. Um, the essence of Mahabharat is very poignant. So I started reading it. I read the Gita now, what, seven times? And each wow. time I learned something new What's about myself. What's the biggest lesson you've learned from it? Um, everything is... Everything is not, nothing's in our control. Nothing's in our control in respect to what's gonna happen in your life, it's gonna happen. And the more you pull and tug, the longer it's gonna take you to get somewhere. So, you know, the whole essence is, we knew who we were when we were born. Mm -hmm. Our soul knew what it came to do. Really? Um, But the mind came in and complicated it by doubts, people putting doubts in, their insecurities, their fears. But we knew, like a baby knows how to eat, to breathe. You don't teach it, it just Mm. knows. And it's like, I I feel that with the soul. It it just knows what it needs to do and it's It's using the physical body to navigate through. Um, So when we say that's not me, Mm. or that's a far away from who I am, that is because that's far from us. The essence of who we are, we know who we are. But sometimes we might not say it because we might, fear of hurting someone else or their feelings and mm-hmm. if I do it this way that's not right okay 
I did that a lot. A lot of my thinking was a lot deeper and a lot, a lot wiser at a young age, but I kept getting suppressed. I, I got suppressed quite a lot with my voice. Mm. Um, it's a whole thing not being seen. I was never seen or heard. Right. <laughs> um, but I was churning a lot of this stuff out when I was young. And now it's the stuff that's got me here. Yeah. It's, it's been my survival mechanism. So in terms of, you know, the, the Gita and the Mahabharata and that, it's just everything is happening. It's like a play. It's all playing out. Mm-hmm. You're sometimes the main character. Sometimes you're in the background. Sometimes everyone's in this play and they're all playing their yeah. role. And you just got to watch and observe. And it's interesting you say, you know, this has taken a long time because a lot of people, when they're losing confidence, they're feeling upset, they expect an instant solution. You know, if I start doing affirmations every day, if I start going for a walk in the morning, if I start meditating for five minutes a day, everything's going to change for me. Mm -hmm. And actually, you need to put a lot of work in, into healing yourself, into growing, into changing something, especially the older you get, right? So I'm 29 now, unfortunately, but... I always think there's something if I need to change it, it's gonna take me a long time to change that because I've had 29 years of conditioning of believing something. Yep. For you, what was that pivotal moment where you actually felt, okay, I'm seeing significant changes to the way I'm speaking to myself? Um, oh, it's just, uh, quite a long time ago, I didn't imagine being here, obviously. Um, but now my confidence journey is probably what, 13, not even 13, probably about 12 years. Yeah. Which sounds really surreal when you, th- wh- when I talk, everyone's like, oh, I must have just had confidence. Right. Um, so I had end stage renal failure at the age of 26. So I got diagnosed with end stage renal failure, which That's basically sorry. my kidneys were packing up. So I was in the midst of doing my degree. So age 10 accident, age 26, you know, now I'm literally surviving, for s- fighting to survive now. So my scars are kind of parked in the back seat for a little while. I'm now navigating how to, s- to, to survive because of my health. Mm. And I went on dialysis. So I was doing my degree at the time okay. in applied health sciences. Went on dialysis. And I just got on with it. So I had to plug myself every night. And then I graduated and just two months after um, I received a call for a, a kidney transplant, um, which was a bit of an inconvenience at the time. <laughs> 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 I was decorating a house at the time, uh, ready to move in. Right. Um, builders and architects and, you know, doing it on my own. It was like, well, how can I make a decision to get a kidney tomorrow morning um, when I've got a meeting with the builders and architects? Wow. <laughs> and the guy, and the, guy, the doctor at the hospital was like, well, you've got five minutes to decide. This is about your life. Yes. I mean, I've waited three years for it. But with me, I don't wait for things. I don't sit by the phone and go, it's going to be any now. I got on with life, mm-hmm. you know, did my degree, painting, decorating a house and renovating, <clears throat> getting on with it. So I get this phone call, it's like, okay, guess I'll come in. In my head, with all my surgery, it's very much, I've had the surgery, a couple of days at home of rest and I get on with things. Okay. Um, so this is what I thought about this, this surgery. It's just another surgery. And you know when someone says it's life-saving and life-changing, it's mm-hmm. like, what does that even mean? Right. I didn't understand it. I was like, because that's not how I live. Went for my transplant. Everything was great. It was amazing. I said to my um, surgeon, I'll be out in three days. He looked at me and went, no one leaves in three days. He goes, it's a week. I said, I'm leaving in three days. And he's like, okay, we'll see. And lo and behold, I did leave in a three and a half days. <laughs> wow. Because he goes, you're doing so well. And then it's all about clinic after. Okay. But I started to feel uncomfortable at home, but... I didn't like my bed, I didn't like the sofa. I was in a lot of pain. And um, next thing, I'm back in hospital again, under surgery. The biggest challenge of my life has got to be 2009. And you think, for anyone who listens to my story, reads my story, like, surely losing your family and going for a plane crash is challenging. I said, no, that felt like a breeze compared to trying to survive 2009 in and out of hospital. I'm doing all the right things in terms of what the doctors are telling me to do, but my body's doing a whole different thing. Even they couldn't understand. And at the points, there were times like, we don't know what to do with you, because they hadn't experienced this. Anything and everything that could go wrong was starting to happen. 
I lost mobility after my second operation. Um, so I had to rehab myself again. Oh my gosh. So it took me three weeks and I said, I'm not leaving this ward apart from walking out, I'm not going crutches, not a wheelchair. My first thought is I cannot be a burden to my grandparents. So it wasn't even about me. It was about, I can't imagine them pushing me in a wheelchair. Like that's what kept me going. Like I had to rehab this leg. They didn't know whether I was going to get movement back or not. So they were just going, you've got this tool, see, but inside I can see the mm. surgeons were like, or my consultant was like, I don't know if she's going to or not. But I did, I did walk out. But in that 2009, there was one time I was in the ward and this is when life changed for me quite pivotally, dramatically actually. It was in the ward at night, really eerie, machines going off and I saw Lord Krishna. And it was real as how you're sitting here. If I could draw him, mm -hmm. I would. He was blue in all his essence, blue and gold. And all he said, well, what I remember, and it's, it's really weird how that came to me, was surrender onto me what you cannot control. I was looking around the ward thinking, what is going on? Because I was in a lot of medication. Hallucination is one of the side effects. Okay. I literally thought I was hallucinating because I'm like, can everyone see it? It's like a visitor's come. Yeah. Can everyone see this visitor? Uh-huh. Everyone's asleep. Because um, there's those wards with the curtains. Everyone's curtains were open. Everyone's sleeping. Mm -hmm. It's just me. And he said, surrender on to me what you can't control, what you cannot control. That's deep. <laughs> Literally thought my mind was like, what is going on? Okay, this, this is really good medication, but what is going on? <laughs> Bearing in mind, it's not like the Gita or the Mahabharat or anything was relevant at that time, as in hadn't picked it up two days before or okay. anything like that. It was just random. It was very random. So beautiful. I did cry because it's like, I might lose him the plot here now. Yeah. But those words, of course, it wasn't overnight. But as I've started to surrender a bit more, mm -hmm. the journey's got better and lighter. And I am literally living my best life right now mm -hmm. because it's free from any illusions. It's free from any... And I don't say pain because I'm not going to experience pain. Yeah. But it's I will have the best coping mechanisms for it. Um. I'm just attracting everything that I want in my life right now. Um, and the only law that I live by is the law of the universe. Um, for me, that's the only law. I can't bend that law. I can't mm -hmm. cheat that law. I can cheat myself, <laughs> mm -hmm. but that's the one law I can't. And I live by that. So I'm here to deliver not my truth, but the universal truth. I'm here to deliver love and compassion. And I know that's why I had to go through all of that to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. And I found self-love in the most highest place in the world. Um, and that's what I give myself. So even my journey from six months to even now has changed. Mm -hmm. So the partner I was attracting six months ago to now, so different. Yeah. Because everything that I was looking for externally, I give to myself now. And not even give, it's just who I am. So when I meet people and they say, you give me the permission to be myself, for me, my job's done or I'm doing my job because to give somebody the permission to be themselves is the greatest gift you can give someone because we're all trying to be someone else or we're trying to hide or we're trying to not face our truth. And that's why when I say we, we're all given what we're given because we can all run from our truth, but one day we'll get cornered and we have to face it. And when we face it and we realize just what magnificent beings we all are, yeah. look how much magic we can create in the world trying really hard not to just bore if I'm <laughs> honest um I like to leave that impact <laughs> I just think despite what you've been through just the way that you are let's just say you hadn't been through anything just hearing the way that you speak it's so refreshing and I never hear people just loving themselves so much and just thinking life is so beautiful and everything is so great and you said you've had to manage some you, you've had to develop some coping mechanisms what are those coping mechanisms when something go wrong for you because the way you're speaking is if nothing could touch you it's um, for me I think it's words the language so 
what could go wrong? The word wrong in itself has been such a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. It's like, what could be challenging and how would you overcome that challenge? Okay. So I flip the script quite a lot. Everything I do is flip the script. Um, grief is mm -hmm. a really big thing. So last year would have marked 31 years anniversary of my accident. And I consciously decided I'm not going to mark it anymore. Okay. Because it's the thing everyone does. Yeah. Five years ago, I lost this or five, whatever. And, and that's okay. Mm. But I don't want to keep doing things that others are doing because it's what we should be doing. Yeah. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't serve you. And I can't wake up on 14th of February and be sad if I'm not sad. So if I'm just wake up and I'm, I don't know, I want to do, do a skydive and be happy, but I'm going to sit there and go, oh, poor me. It's 20 years now. Uh, that's not me. Right. So I'm like, stop marking something when it doesn't feel right. Right. I might cry on the 19th of March. Who knows? Because the soul will be mourning something then. Yes. It might not even be this lifetime. It might be in the last lifetime or 100 ones before. I'm not going to sit here and navigate why I'm crying or what's going on. Just let it. You know, the soul uses the heart and the heart uses the tears. And that's literally it. I'm just a vessel. So I don't need to sit and go, and as women, as maybe it's the time of my month or because of, you know, we always look for reasons. Yeah. We don't need to. Mm -hmm. I just allow it to flow. But on the 14th of Feb, I might not feel like that. Mm. So now I took the power back. Yes, superficially we celebrate Valentine's Day, you know, hearts and flowers and cards. But I don't think there's anything, I don't see there's anything wrong with that. Why yeah. not? Yeah. It's okay. If you're going to make someone feel good for that one day, then so be it. Great, yeah. So I do that to myself. I take myself out on a date. I do the whole hearts and flowers. And if somebody comes along with me, like a cousin or aunt or whoever, yeah. fine. But I take myself on a date and I enjoy the day for what it is. And more, more than anything, I'm just grateful for another day here, you know? Another day of breath, to be honest. Um, and you said 29, unfortunately. I'd be like, 29 is a privilege, <laughs> to be fair, you know? I think this is the last year of my 20s. So I'm having a mental breakdown every it's time okay. I say it. <laughs> when we go into the other side, it's even better. Everyone says liberated. that. Everyone's like, 30s <laughs> is the best. Uh, but, yeah. you know, it's been such an honor to speak to you today. And I just, I guess I have no words of how powerful and positive and radiant you are and the Thank energy you. that you bring to a room. But before we close, I often ask people to do a truth or dare. So which would you pick? Oh, let's do truth. I like the Thank truth. Thank God you said truth. <laughs> Every time someone says dare, I'm like, crap, what am I going to do? Please skydive in uh, um, the palm. Um, okay. <laughs> Maybe not today. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth would be, tell me one of the best moments of your life. Oh, there's so many pivotal ones. Okay. I'm going to choose something that's very, very recent. And it's... Okay. Um, just more so because it, it just happened recently. I was in Dubai in July mm -hmm. and it was for my birthday. And, you know, the power of manifestation of, of belief is I always wanted to celebrate my birthday for me. But every time I celebrated it, I wasn't sure that everyone else had a good time. Right. So I'd create the birthdays that I wanted, but they were never about me. This time I took myself to Dubai. I ended up doing a photo shoot, I recorded a podcast and delivered a talk. So it's all wow. the things that I love. But this birthday, I got treated, like I literally got spoiled. And one thing my auntie said to me when I was telling her, she goes, that's exactly how your mum would have done it. Like full on glam and mm -hmm. all just dressed up to the nines, glitz and glam, um, made me feel special like it was my day. Mm -hmm. And there was one photo my friend um, Anna took of me when we went out for dinner and it's literally my mum. And I've never looked like my mum before. Well, mm. I haven't seen it. But that picture, she was just snapping away. But when I sent it to family, and I didn't tell them, I just said, I just sent it as, this is me. They went, Tuls, that's your mum. That's the first thing they said. I went, thank God. And she came through. Yeah. For me, that's just the most beautiful moment. <sighs> that is so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming Thank on. Thank you. And sorry I've been... Uh, no, but you did go. <laughs> <laughs> but I really appreciate you telling your story. Thank you. And um, I really appreciate you coming on. So oh, thank, thank you for having me. Thank you. Hey, everyone. And thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Wherever you're listening or watching, if you could press the like, follow and subscribe button, it would mean the world to me.